Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we tackle some more concrete issues. You know, a lot of times we have homeowners that have stairs, and they tend to be very dangerous when they get wet because they're so smooth. Well, we have an opposite situation where a set of stairs, the concrete's pretty rough, and it's actually tearing up some shoes. Shoes are expensive, so we're going to see if we can kind of smooth it out but still create an anti-skid surface. Yeah, concrete, after it's poured, it needs to be smoothed out. And you know, if it's not at all, it, it'll dry really, really rough. Um, so, yeah, we'll have a couple of solutions for that. And um, we also spoke to a homeowner who has water in his basement. Now, that's not the unusual part. The unusual part is he lived there for 60 years without having water in his basement. So what happened? Well, we're going to talk to him and see if we can find out how to stop that water from coming in. I'll bet he can find out what's going on there because anything that's held up 60 years, there's bound to be something has changed, maybe a little landscaping, maybe a gutter problem, but uh, we'll see if we can uh, figure that part of it out. You know, I'll tell you, when you do some ceramic tile work and one of the most important parts of it is not only the preparation to make sure the surface you're putting your tile down on is what it should be, but also there's a lot of cleanup to be done because if you leave grout on the surface, can you remove it? Well, we have a few suggestions for one of our homeowners and one of our listeners that uh, I think is going to solve that problem. And for the simple solution, I'm going to share five tips on how to properly anchor a wooden post to a concrete footing. You wouldn't think there'd be much to know about that or how you could possibly do it wrong, right? You dig a hole, you put in some concrete, and you stick the post in the hole. But there actually are ways to make sure that post lasts as long as possible and is rock solid for years to come. We've all seen those situations where just what happened there? Why is that lean or why is it not just right? So those are some great tips. So we have a lot to get to. So let's get started right now. Now, Joe, while you were um, you and um, uh, our engineer Dennis had your little sleepy heads on your pillow this morning, right? Uh, our producer um, Mark um, Ingram and I and a crew was out doing a live segment for the Weather Channel. Uh, I'm s- sorry y'all were not able to wake up in time to 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 see it, so I thought I would share some of the tidbits with you. So where did where did you go? Where did you end up shooting? Well, we actually shot it uh, in my house because okay. uh, the whole the whole thing is there's been so many power outages. Did you know there's been power outages from time to time, Joe? Oh, you're very, you're very funny. Danny <laughs> mentions that because we had here in Connecticut, we had a hurricane blow through I mean, two weeks ago. We lost power for five days. And then last week, a tornado touched down someplace in Connecticut, not right here, not, right in, not in Roxbury where I live, but nearby. And we were out of power about two days. So I don't know what's going on with the planet, but I've been in Connecticut most of my life. I never remember hurricanes or tornadoes. Now we're getting them both every year. Yeah, but uh, yeah, getting, getting the power in knocked out thankfully i have a transfer switch and a portable generator so we can at least keep some of the lights on and refrigerator running but yeah yeah that's rough that's well, rough that, that, that was one of the things we touched on is just some of the things that you can do you know to prepare for that and you know if you know some bad weather's coming there's a number of things i always like to think about four things you know you need light so you know some type of light and the old hurricane lamps and and oil burning things like that that is so you know maybe it's romantic but it's not a good thing to have in your house necessarily especially when you can have rechargeable lamps and lights things that maybe you know might look like a camping lamp or something right, like, like a that. lantern yeah, lanterns. But but we found one that uh, has two different uh, intensities of light on it. Uses an 18 volt battery, and you can get up to 72 hours on one charge on this wow. light. Wow. What do you think about that? I mean, that's a lot of time. You don't you're not going to leave it on the whole time, of course. But uh, right. to be able to get through a two or three day period where your power's out, that's that's all you need. So light's very important. Another thing's important is comfort, especially for those your family and so forth. And amazing what some of these rechargeable fans, I actually have one that sits on top of a five gallon bucket. You fill the bucket up with water, you have a little tube that goes down there and it actually becomes a misting fan. Oh. So you have the cooling Keeps effect cool. of the water. Yeah. And so, so that's a good one. Another thing you want to do is to 
stay aware. You know, there's so many apps now for your phone, um, even an app that you can connect with your local utility company, and they will uh, keep you in real time abreast of when you can expect power, estimated time, ex- expect power back on your house. So, you're, And of course, with weather apps and so forth, you're able to see, you know, what's happening on there. So that's a good one. But But keeping your food cold. Now, if you have a refrigerator that's full, and the power goes out, you can keep food safe in there for up to 48 hours without any power. If it's half full, then you can figure around 24 hours. But what I do is I take a couple big water jugs, put them down in the freezer and freeze them. Then when that temperature, if my power's off for a few hours and that temperature starts dropping in the refrigerator, I can take those jugs of water, move them up into the refrigerator, or move food down into the freezer either way. But the main thing is don't stand there with the the, the doors open, gawking it. Well, what am I going to have for dinner today? Right, exactly. You know, you, that's, and that's that's the case whether there's a power outage or not, of course. Right. And uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, simple things like that that we were recommending to our audience there on the Weather Channel um, on just a few things like that. And uh, and also the, the little battery packs, you know, that you see for your telephone. Um, these things have gotten so advanced now, you can even plug in other things to that. Um, right. Like yep. uh, USB cables and so forth to charge almost anything you have in your house. So, you know, it's a good time to think about that. And I had someone tell me one day, well, why do I want to buy all of these batteries and water and all of these things and put them in a box just to sit there in my house? Well, my theory has always been you have your emergency box, but use it anytime you want. You go ahead and get the batteries out of it. Just remember to replace it. You know, take your playing cards that we like to throw in our emergency box, take it out, play some cards, put them back in there. So it's, uh, it just makes sense to take a little bit of time and prepare for all of that. So we hope we were able to help uh, a few people with some of the recommendations that we had uh, there on the Weather Channel. Greg is joining us right now. Greg, welcome to the show. Hey guys. Well, thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Well, I've got an unusual problem. Um, okay. Unfortunately, I've got some concrete steps that are just rough, um, so rough that really when my wife and I walk on them barefoot, you know, it just it just hurts. And I'm having an issue right now with either continuing to buy my wife new shoes or fixing <laughs> these concrete steps. And I really would just like to fix the concrete steps. Yeah, no matter what we tell you, you might be investing in shoes no matter what. But, yeah, I know uh, it. I, I understand. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> well, well, you, it's kind of a conflict here in one way, if you think about it, because, um, you know, it, so many times we're dealing with concrete steps that are too slick, that they get a little bit of moisture right. on them, yep. and you have potential for a slip and fall. So so the treads being uh, having a little bit of texture to them is really a good thing. Now, if it's, if it's just too much and too aggressive, you can take um, a stone, a pumice stone, or um, heck, just a brick or any kind of piece of uh, masonry, and just uh, rub it a little bit, and it'll certainly knock the top of it off. Now, your 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 riser not your riser doesn't necessarily need to be, um, you know, uh, rough at all. That can be smoothed out a good bit. But uh, Joe, what do you think on that? I mean, there's a um, you know, I've even see seen people take disc sanders to right, kind yeah. of grind that out a little bit. Yeah, well, Greg, you're right. I mean, there are cases where the concrete is just too rough on the treads and the risers the treads where you step and the risers are the vertical surfaces and it's those vertical surfaces where you often will scuff up your shoe right because the top of the shoe is your toe or your heel is hitting it so um yeah you could grind it off i mean they have they have grinders made that you can put in a angle grinder um and you could also skim coat it put on get some masonry products some kind of resurfacer and skim coat but what i would first suggest what i, I think I'm, what i'm would do if this was mine there's a product that kills makes most people know them for their primer it's k-i-l-z and they make a product called over armor textured resurfacer which is a perfect name because that's what it does okay it's an acrylic resin coating that you can brush or roll on and it fills rough surfaces and it actually will fill cracks up to about a quarter inch wide um one gallon covers 75 square feet so it's probably way more than you need um, but i would check that out because that would be a really easy way to you just brush it on if you want to just do one step just to check make sure it's working well um, but i think that would probably be the easiest way and a pretty effective way and if it ever wears out you can you'll probably have plenty left over you can just go over it again put a second coat on 
Greg, be a good husband, though, and go out and buy a couple pairs of shoes, okay? Well, you know, I, I buy two or three at a time, and then these steps take one away. So I, you know, I, I'll continue <laughs> to do that for sure. But I, I've got my weekend project lined up now, and I, I surely appreciate your guys' help. All right, Greg, we're glad to, You're glad to have you on. And uh, if we can help you again, let us know. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye-bye. Time for our best new product segment, brought to you by the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Smart home products are extremely popular these days, but homeowners are often frustrated by where to start so that multiple smart projects products will work together. The folks at WISE have solved that problem with their Smart Home Starter Bundle. It includes a camera, two contact sensors, a motion sensor, three smart bulbs, two smart plugs, and an SD card. Now all of this gives you the ability to control lights and electrical devices in your home, whether you're on the couch or somewhere across the country. That's convenient, but the system also provides security by allowing you to monitor entryways and activity both locally and remotely. Now, it's all designed to work together at a very affordable price point. For more information on this WISE, and that's spelled W-Y-Z-E, Smart Home Starter Bundle, log on to Home Depot. Dot com. It's gone mainstream now that so many things can be wireless. Um, it just makes it, you know, and, and to be able to do a step-by-step step on it is where a lot of people are realizing. You, you kind of get, uh, you know, you want to you make sure, Joe, on these things, they're practical, that it's not just right. a gadget. And they're compatible, you know, if you're buying a bunch of separate units. So this is really a very wise way, so to speak, to sell this, where you put it all together in a bundle, and when you get it at home, you know that they're all compatible, and they're all designed to be put together. So, yeah, that, I'm, I'm going to have to check that out. Let's go right back to the Today's Homeowner Hotline. We're going to Colorado, and John's on the phone. John, welcome to the Today's Homeowner Radio Show. Yeah, hi guys. How are you today? We're great. Hey, we're doing good. Hate to hate to hear you're having a little problem there in the attic, but uh, tell us all about it, and we'll see if we can figure it out. Yeah, well, we have a cabin there in the mountains of Colorado, as you know, and our elevation's above ten thousand feet, so we're up there real high, and uh, we get snow loads in excess of four hundred inches a year. Wow. Um, yeah, and we we have an older problem that comes inside the cabin that's the strongest in and around the bathroom. And the odors are coming from the attic. The builders have vented the plumbing lines in the attic. Uh, anyway, um, the, I might also add a, a, another little deal about this. The gray water from the shower and the sink uh, does not drain into a septic tank, but it drains into a, a gravel sump that we excavated outside and then backfilled it with gravel and things for the gray water. A couple of years ago, I, because of the odors, I installed these studer vents over the open pipes that's up in the attic. And then I installed a small vent under the eave on two sides of the house. And each vent is about five inches by five inches. And when I installed these several years ago, it took care of the odors until this year. Now, the odors aren't quite as strong as they were before, but they still demand attention. And my question to you guys is, should I install larger vents or am I thinking maybe a fan at one of these vents might be the deal or what suggestions might you have? Well, I guess I, I would go back to the idea of, um, it, you know, still venting them to the outside. I know the quantity of, of snow is a concern on that. I'll, I'll, let me um, kind of ask Joe on that. Joe, um, even in heavy snow situations, what's the alternative in turning those vents out it seems like turning a vent out and then turning it around you know to where it's upside down uh prevents that odor from getting inside and still moves it to the outside what do you think joe yeah so right now you have vent stacks going through the roof is that it john they're uh, under the eaves uh under the roof so oh, they're under the eaves right mm -hmm. well there, there are certainly ways and very effective ways to vent an attic space but that's not going to solve the problem of what's creating the odor um, you know, if you want to vent it, they do make, you know, electric fans. Um, they're called shutter mount exhaust fans. And you can put one, you can put one on one end of the gable and blowing out, obviously. And then on the other opposite end of the gable, you could just put a standard gable vent, you know, gable end vent that just has no motor. It's just a louvered vent with a screen behind it. And the idea is, of course, right. that the fan will suck air in through there. Um, okay. If you went to, there's a, I, I often buy mechanical products uh, that are hard to find elsewhere. 
at a <clears throat> excuse me at a place called supplyhouse.com and if you if, if you look up shutter mount exhaust fan you'll see what i'm talking about um okay. the local local lumberyards or home center might sell them as well um, but that again it's not going to solve the problem what's creating the odor but it will that will definitely exhaust it that, that would definitely move that air out and prevent it from mm-hmm. from laying in the attic and then i'm, I'm assuming you then smell it down in the house mm-hmm. that's right we can so, you know, when you have like four feet of snow on the roof and it all slides off of that steep pitch, right. you know, we yeah. can't have anything like that because it just rip it right off the roof. Sure. You have a metal but, roof, John? Yes, we do. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's when that snow comes off, you better make sure you're not standing underneath the <laughs> eve of the house, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, okay, I can try that. Um, I'll shop at that supplyhouse.com and see what I can find and uh, install something else that takes care of those odors. Great. Well, good luck with that. All right. Well, glad glad to have you on the show, and uh, certainly hope that that helps. I can see where that would be a, a concern. And uh, but in, but get up there and enjoy that cabin. That sounds like a great place. Uh, oh, it certainly is. Yeah, everybody would enjoy it. It's a five uh, a million dollar view up there. There so, you go. All right. Well, thank you. Let's go to Washington right now, and Ed has a call for us. I have a crack in my driveway. I'm wondering what I should do to fill those. There's the concrete driveway all right well that's very common um you know concrete's going to crack no matter where it is and certainly in a driveway um there are two different products that most companies make including quickrete which we often recommend because they're terrific products and they really know their business when it comes to concrete and repairing concrete Um, but the two different products are a cement type product that will fill in and it's made up with some sort of um, cement, you know, not concrete, but cement. Um, and Quickrete makes one called Concrete Crack Seal, S E A L. And then the other type of product is more of a caulking, so it's it's more flexible. They make one called Concrete Crack Sealant. Slight difference there. I usually prefer the sealants because they expand and contract a little bit. So if the crack moves, and it's certainly going to move, it won't just the material that you put in there won't won't crack and fall out. So I would try something in a caulking tube like the concrete crack sealant. It's only about six dollars a tube. You can do a lot of it, you know. But as we often say, the repair might be more noticeable than the crack. So take that into consideration as well. Okay, let's go to back to Alabama, and we have Denise. Hey, Danny. I have a question about getting adhesive off concrete. Um, how would you go about doing that? Um, I've got some vinyl that has been down for 20 years, and I'm trying to get it up, and there's adhesive, gooey stuff underneath. I was wanting to get it up so I could put down ceramic tile. Okay. Well, Denise, I'll tell you, um, you re- if that vinyl is adhered well to the concrete slab, and even if it has a tear here and there, you can kind of remove a little bit of that torn area around there and then put a little floor patch compound on it. And you're ready to go with ceramic right on top of that vinyl. You really don't have to take it off. A lot of people think you have to take it off and scrape it and get back to the original slab. But actually, uh, that serves as a very good surface for you to go right down over that. So don't work any more than you have to and go ahead and... Uh, and allow that to um, serve as your surface underneath. Joe, a lot of times, you know, that's one of the biggest questions we get is, can I put this kind of flooring on top of this kind of flooring? And right. so often, you know, going on top of vinyl like that, as long as the vinyl is stuck well to that, works extremely well. Yeah, and if in this case she has the concrete underneath, which would support the tile beautifully. If this was a hardwood, uh, a subfloor of plywood, rather, a plywood floor, you know, and you, and you took it up and there's lo- took up the vinyl floor and there's lots of glue on there, it's like, well, how do I get the glue off? Well, I wouldn't even bother getting the glue off or the flooring. I would have gone right over it with quarter-inch backer board um, and then, you know, set the tile on that. But in this case, you could probably go right over it. Now, just check, make sure that the thin set mortar you're going to be using, you know, will it will adhere well to the the vinyl floor um but yeah that that would save her a lot of work i don't know how big a room she's talking about but to have to scrape off adhesive is not not a fun way to spend the day no not at all of course you know if you if you have a situation where you're dealing with a wood subfloor and you're trying to put ceramic on it uh, let me tell you it doesn't matter who tells you you can install it over plywood 
don't do it. I mean, that's a significant investment for you to put down ceramic over um, any kind of floor. But if it's a wood subfloor, you got to have cement backer board there. It's been proven over and over and over. Or the other is uh, the the company Schluter, which, um, right. Joe, you've dealt a lot with those with that wonderful tile book that you wrote. Yeah, that's uh, uncoupling membrane. It's called their their particular brand is called Ditra D I T R A, and it's hard to explain what it is, but it's like a plastic dimpled plastic surface that you roll out and and you put that down, and that separates any movement between the flooring and the tile. And uh, yeah, that's the reason they make quarter inch thick backer boards. Some people will think, well, why do they make backer boards only a quarter inch thick? Well, so you can put it on top of a plywood subfloor. Most plywood subfloors are at least an inch thick. And the, 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 recommend, the recommendation from the tile council is that a tile floor should be one and a quarter inches thick minimum. So if you have a one inch plywood floor, that's the reason they make quarter inch backer board to go over that and that meets the requirement. And the reason you want that is if there's any flex in that plywood floor, those tiles are gonna pop, crack, the grout joints are gonna, gonna crack. And that's what, whenever you see a concrete floor, excuse me, a tile floor that's failing, it's almost always, always because there's movement it doesn't take much of course a little bit of movement in the subfloor and those tiles you know will, will fail right now we're going to pennsylvania where we get a lot of calls each and every week bill is on the line and bill i know you have a question about ceramic tile and grout and boy do i have the expert that can handle that for you so let us know your question and i guarantee you joe truini can just nail it with the right answer I can't wait, Danny. I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> First off, let me just say I really enjoy listening to your show and feel very fortunate uh, and honored to be on the air with you. Oh, well, I certainly appreciate that. We uh, we, we enjoy this. You hear us uh, cutting up and having fun each and every week. And uh, and so um, tell us about this uh, this grout job. Now, did you do the project or did you no, have no, someone? No, here, no. Here's my... Yeah, this okay. is it, 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 my concern. It, it's not a major deal, it, it, uh-huh. but it's something I added to my to to do list a while ago. Mm-hmm. And, and not bragging, but at it, seventy seven, I'm going to keep that to do list short. Oh no, keep <laughs> it you, long. Yeah, if you understand long. what I mean, <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, you you keep that you keep that list going. You got a you got a lot of time left. <laughs> well, Danny, there's some things I can do and some things I can't do anymore. <laughs> that's true. That's true of all of us, Bill. That's exactly that's right. Uh-huh. Well, you young guys, you, you wouldn't know. <laughs> well, anyway, my wife and I recently uh, replaced the flooring in our guest bathroom with a beige porcelain tile with a matching beige grout. Now, unwittingly, uh, the installer didn't sponge off all the excess grout and left maybe three or four half-dollar quarter-sized spots of grout that quickly hardened, I'd say, to the texture of about 80-grit sandpaper. Yeah, that's not surprising. Yeah, we only noticed the problem when we started to walk on the floor and dirt started to collect in the excess grout. So the question is simple. What do we do to remove this grout without marring or scratching the uh, surface of the tiles? All right. Well, first, Bill, you know, regardless of your age, (laughs) <laughs> the length, the length, the length of your to-do list isn't important. It's important that you have a to-do list, whether it's one <laughs> item or two items. That's all, and just keep adding to them. Don't look at the whole long list. Just look at the ones at the top one or two. That's my that's my philosophy. Joe, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now getting get, getting to your problem here. Um, yeah, the fact that the the tile and the grout were the same color is probably why the installer missed it. He just didn't see it, right? Exactly. Um, but, and it doesn't matter if it's just two or three small spots. It might not matter to anybody else in the world, but it matters to you and your wife. You live there, right? So I think it's an issue we, you have to deal with. The first thing to do, and maybe you've tried this, is just soak it with warm water. No, nothing else is warm water. Let it soak for as long as, you know, a couple of hours. Put a wet towel on top of it. Just see if that will help dissolve it. If it softens a little bit, then you can scrape it off with not metal, but anything wood. I would even like a wooden stir stick, like a paint stir stick, something like that, because you don't want to scratch up anything. Um, the, The glazed tile is pretty rough you know, pretty durable, but you don't want to take a chance of possibly scratching it. And if that doesn't work, they do make a product specifically for this. It's called, I'll spell it for you, but it's called Sulfamic Acid Cleaner. Mm -hmm. And that's spelled S-U-L 
F like in Frank, F A M I C, sulfamic acid cleaner. Um, there's a company that we mentioned um, regularly called Custom Building Products. They make one. It's about fourteen dollars for a pound. It's like a powder, and you mix it in a bucket. It has to be a plastic bucket. Mix it in a plastic bucket, and you want to mix it slightly stronger than recommended for just cleaning normal surfaces. Um, so you put a little more of this in the water, or a little less water, however, and okay. pour pour it onto the grout. Wait ten or fifteen minutes. Um, and make sure the area stays wet. You want it to dry out, and one and that will dissolve the that will dissolve the grout, the old, the hardened grout. Then you can scrub it off with a nylon brush or a plastic putty knife, something like that. So, I mean, unfortunately, I think it only comes in a pound, and you're probably going to need two tablespoons. But I don't know yeah. what to tell you. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you about that. Keep hiring the same tile contractor, and maybe you'll use up the whole box. But. Um, <laughs> But uh, th that, that's what I would try the warm water first. If that, like I said, if that doesn't work or if it works a little bit, you know, then do it again. Do it two or three times. This way you don't have okay. to go to the acid cleaner. But does the uh, uh, warm water sink, does that in many cases do it or? Well, it depends on how old this is, how, how long has it been sitting there? Well, it's less than a year. Yeah, well, less than a year is a l pretty long time. I would say. I mean, I couldn't tell you, to tell you the truth. I mean, it, like I said, if it, if it softens it a little bit, because don't forget, this is it's not epoxy grout, I'm, I'm hoping. It's probably water-based grout, so, you know, a little water should soften it up enough. And it may um, just it may cause the separation between that grout and the glazed tile, so it may be all that you need in in, in uh, soaking that, like Joe's re recommending, and just take that stirrer stick or popsicle stick or something like that and bump it. Who knows? It may pop right off, clean sure. it up real good, and then even though there may be a little discoloration on what's under there and your adjacent tile, that'll go away really quickly. Good, good advice. Good, Bill. Well, and thanks for listening, Bill. We appreciate it. Okay, and if I have to buy that uh, sulfonic acid, you guys can call me if you need some because I'll probably have a whole lot left. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's good. We'll remember that. We'll remember okay. where. Our, where <laughs> well, thanks so much, Bill. I hope. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you. I hope you have a great week, and we'll talk to you again. Bye bye now. Bye bye. One of the things we love sharing with you is our simple solution. Joe, what do you have this week? All right, Danny. When installing a handrail post for an exterior like staircase or deck or porch, it's always important to dig down and set the post in concrete. So here are five tips to ensure that this post stays rock solid for several years. First, you always dig the post hole at least three times wider than the post. So, you know, these are typically four by four posts, which measure three and a half inches square. So the hole should be at least 11 inches wide, 11 to 12 inches wide. And to anchor the post to the concrete, before you set the post in, drive three or four three inch long decking screws into the lower portion of the post. The portion that will be buried underground and drive them in at an angle. They can be facing up or facing down, but a little bit of an angle. That way, if the post shrinks, and it most certainly will, the the post will still be anchored to the concrete footing. Because often what happens is, right, you put it, you pour concrete around it, the post shrinks, and now suddenly it doesn't fit so well. So driving in those screws will help lock it to the footing. And pour, when you pour the concrete all the, around, all the way around the post, but keep it about two or three inches below grade, meaning below the surrounding ground, because that will allow you to then fill in with gravel or bark mulch or even soil and grass if you want, although it's usually best to keep that away from the post so it dries out. And then at the top of the po top of the footing where the concrete meets the, um, the post, use a margin trowel or even just a putty knife and smooth and slope that concrete away from the post. You want it sloping away so obviously any water hits that, it drains away from the post, not toward the post. And finally, the last one is use two diagonal braces to temporarily hold the post perfectly plumb until the concrete hardens. And they actually do make a really cool level. It's very affordable. It's called the post level. It's a right angle. It's usually made of plastic and has a strap on it. And you just put it on the corner of the post. You, you strap it around to hold it in place. And it has a bullseye level, meaning a round level, which just has a single bubble. And you just move the post back and forth until the bubble's in the middle of that bullseye. And you know that the post is perfectly plumb in both directions. So there you go. Five quick ways to make sure that handrail post or any kind of post is, is installed properly and will be rock solid.
Now it's time for our podcast question of the week, and we'd love to hear your question. You can send it to us by simply going to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Chuck from Lansing, Michigan asks, Hey, Danny, I have a 30-year-old garage floor that is finished smooth. It's not broom finish, and it's in pretty good shape, but much of the surface looks like the surface of the moon. Many craters. Now, wow. none of these craters are deeper than eighth inch. I'm looking for a product that can be spread, preferably with a squeegee-type tool, not tr- trialed on, if possible, over the surface to repair it. Now, I remember Glenn Hagee talking about elastomeric products that would move around as the surface would change. Thanks for your help. Um, now, Glenn Hagee, if um, many of you may remember that Glenn Hagee was a, a very well-known and very popular radio host, and um, on his passing, um, we took over a lot of the stations at his request in order to move forward with his message and, and also take care of people. So we appreciate you mentioning um, Glenn in this um, email, Chuck. And and I'll tell you, um, one of the things there, uh, and, and Joe, wouldn't you think, a lot of times I think when you have surface issues like that, that so many times it goes back to the original pouring of the concrete and maybe they put a little too much water in there. That right, water exactly. you know, rises to the top and it ends up not being as strong of a surface as it should be. Yeah, sometimes that's called spalling, S-P-A-L-L-I-N-G, spalling, when the just the top surface kind of flakes off. Mm-hmm. And as Chuck mentioned, it's not any deeper than an eighth inch, and that's pretty that's pretty typical. Um, yeah, the elastomeric product that Glenn referred to was probably paint, um, which would be, you know, we don't usually recommend putting paint on concrete, but if you're going to, that is the paint to use, elastomeric, because it does, it's got a little rubbery feel to it and it expands and contracts. But that's if the surface is perfectly smooth and flat. In right, this case, right. I think he's going to have to, we, he could use a resurfacer. We talk about a product called Recap all the time, which works great. And for patching, what you want to do is take the Recap and mix it a little thicker than recommended for spreading as a resurfacer. And you can use that to patch the areas that are have been you know, blistered out here like a crater. And once that hardened, then you can pour, mix it to the proper consistency and pour it out and spread it with a squeegee, as uh, Chuck was hoping, um, and just redo the whole, I mean, I guess you could do parts of it, but at that point, I would just do the whole garage floor. Yeah, I'll tell you, you know, using the rubber squeegee like that, and we're talking about a big one that might be 14, 15 inches wide with a nice, you know, um, solid extension handle on it. And that way you get a good, consistent, like eighth inch or sixteenth of an inch over the entire surface. Makes it a lot easier to have a nice, smooth finish on it. And now, of course, you can come back when you're using the recap and use a brush or a broom to apply just a little bit of a anti-skid surface to it, which is often the case when you're talking about garages or porches and so forth just so that you don't have a slip and fall situation and while i'm talking about it too um joe just last week um we recapped or resurfaced an asphalt driveway we didn't use recap we used an asphalt sealer but i'll tell you if you paint that on with a roller you're almost wasting your time it may look i mean it's not going to last at all. But I'll tell you, you take that squeegee and you use that for the uh, asphalt driveway sealer and you get right. a little millage on there. You get an eighth of an inch or so over that whole thing and allow it to dry. Boy, that will really make an asphalt driveway not only look a lot better, but last a lot, lot longer. Because it'll fill in a lot of those little um, thin, thin hairline cracks. Right. It'll end up being bigger cracks and everything. And uh, that certainly makes a big difference. Yeah, because even a thick nap roller is not going to apply a the sealer, uh, the sealant, as thick as you'd like. So, yeah, the squeegee is the way to go. You just push it around. I often wonder, like, what if you're on a really steep driveway? How does that work with a squeegee? You pour it out. Yeah. You have to, like, run down and keep pushing it up the hill. <laughs> push, push it back <laughs> Okay, up. honey, you stand at the bottom of the driveway <laughs> with a squeegee. I'm going to pour this five-gallon bucket and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you may want to make sure that texture is just yeah, right, right when you're pouring yeah. that out there. Good good, good point. Well, we always have a lot of fun being with you each and every week here on the Today's Homeowner podcast. Certainly appreciate comments that we get, the great reviews we get. And, again, encourage you to send us a question at any time. Todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Danny Lipford along with my buddy Joe Truini. Thank you so much for listening to this Today's Homeowner podcast. <music>